Jesus, we want to say thank you. Holy Spirit, we want to bless your name for another opportunity again to come before you, for another privilege to learn of you. We ask that the spirit of truth, you will guide us into all truth. We ask that Jesus will be made manifest, that the Father will find pleasure, that the word of the Lord will come alive like a double-edged sword, that will cut between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, thoughts and intents, that discerning of the things that hide in our heart will be made bare so that we can align with the will of God. Oh, Father, that which you did to the prophets of old, that which you did to the apostles, that which you want to do to the vessels of the end time, we come that it may be done unto us, so that we'll be found vessels that the Father can pour out in, and the nations will drink without contamination, without limitation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Blessed be your holy name, Jesus. We come to you, Abba Father, because we are a God that answers prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Welcome once again to Discovering True Riches. It's a Bible study series where as a ministry, God has granted us the privilege and the honor to look into his word together with you because you have availed yourself also. We are grateful for that. And see how God can prune us and build us to become that whom he can trust his counseling and not suffer loss. You're welcome. Call your neighbor, call your friend. Tell others about it. It is time to look into the word of life again. We believe the Holy Ghost will help us as he has in previous times to look into his word and to become more like him. Last time, we began to see what Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount where he was beginning to talk to disciples beyond the crowd, that which will shape them for what he was going to do in the end time, for what he was going to pour out within them. We saw how that God began by talking about those who are poor in spirit in Matthew chapter 5 from verse 1. In that very place, we were beginning to see that it is a blessedness for a man to know, to know that he needs God. If a man comes to a point where the need for God is not known, there is a blessedness he is losing already. It is a beautiful thing to even feel the need for God, to know the need for God, because that is what will make you pursue him, to seek him, to hunger after him. Furthermore, we'll see, as we go to the book of Matthew chapter 5, and we'll proceed further from where we stopped the last time. The last time we saw blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Today we'll be pressing further to see the next thing that Jesus was speaking about, a state of blessedness that a disciple should have. If you will learn of Jesus, if you will grow with Jesus, there is a state that your heart, that your personality ought to be in. That state Jesus calls blessed. You know, many times when we say God blessed me, we talk about a car, a house, an appointment, a business contract, a job, whatever it is, it doesn't mean those are not blessings. Yes, they are. But they are blessings that are much more in the heart of the Father than the temporal things that he himself even offers us. Last time we saw, that even though the land Canaan was given to Abraham, he sought for a place that his build and maker was God himself. He sought for something that is eternal. Today we want to press further to see what God calls blessed. What is it that makes us happy? Does it have to be something tangible we hold in our hand? Or is there something much more, as the Bible calls it, true riches? I pray that we will discover that as we press further. So Jesus begins to tell us another dimension of blessedness that a disciple should have on this journey. If you have it, be glad. If you don't, it is something we should all look for, that heaven will look upon us and say blessed. He said something, Matthew chapter 5 and from verse 4. He said, blessed are they that mourn for thee 
shall be comforted. How do you walk into a place and see a man mourning and then you call him blessed? Wouldn't the man look at you and think you are being sarcastic? How do you see a man in a scenario where naturally speaking he should be mocked yet you call the man blessed? You see, from the perspective of God, there are many things that the carnal mind does not see as a blessing. Do you remember Jesus said it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of rejoicing? Because many times when a man mourns, he begins to reflect about life. He begins to consider the true state of life, whether what he is looking upon is vanity or eternity is with it. So Jesus said, bless that day that mourn. We are not talking about any form of mourning. No, no. I am not talking about the mourning that speaks of depression. That's of the devil. The Bible says godly sorrow. It brings about repentance. It means if there is a godly sorrow, there is an ungodly sorrow. Satan seeks to see that we sorrow. But not in the right way. You remember Judas Iscariot. He sorrowed about what he did. Returned the money. Cried about it. And hung himself. He didn't run back to Jesus. He hung himself. And don't forget the Bible says, Cursed is he that hangs upon a tree. But do you see, there was a sorrow that Peter had when he denied Jesus three times. He wept. But it was a sorrow that brought him to repentance. There is a form of mourning, a form of sorrow that when Jesus sees in the life of a person, Jesus calls the person blessed. Blessed are ye if he mourn. That kind of a mourning. He say you will be comforted. Does that mean whoever lacks that kind of a mourning has lost on a certain dimension of blessedness? Have you seen a man before that possibly he's blessed in his finances but he's not blessed in his health? Maybe he's blessed in his health but he's not blessed in his finances. You see, there are different dimensions of blessedness that comes into a man's life. And in my opinion, God wants us to have it all. Every form of blessedness that he has in mind for us. Blessed are they that mourn. What kind of mourning, what should erupt in the life of a man that God will look upon that man and say, this mourning means this man is blessed. Today, as we go through scriptures, We'll be looking at the life of David. David was such a man that the Bible says he had a heart that was after God's own heart. I want to see how David had certain dimensions of mourning that made him a blessed personality. Oh, even when Jesus came, he was called the son of David. And he was given the throne of David that will be everlasting. So there must have been something David learned and he's one of the people that I see in scripture that had that blessing of mourning. As we pick the reasons that makes a man mourn, we will find out those who did it mourn and lost this blessedness and how David, as a child, as a man of God, was able to uphold this blessedness and the outcome of it at the end. Do talk to no others, share, like, and let others get aware of what is happening. So that they can join us as we press further. The first thing about mourning that any true believer should have is the mourning that comes by conviction when a man goes into error. I had a story many years ago from a pastor of a lady he was trying to counsel. And the lady said, anytime she lies, she cries. She feels terrible about it. She confesses it. She can't hold back. But there was something funny. But anytime she fornicates, she doesn't feel anything wrong. There was no sense of conviction to make her mourn, to make her grieve about that error. You see, it's different from guilt. When a man falls into sin, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, propagates guilt. And the intention of guilt is to bring a man to a place where the man cannot commit to 
the mercies of God to be delivered. But you see, conviction is different. Conviction is God bringing you to an awareness of an error so that your sin can come before you and then God can heal you. You say, if you say you do not sin, you lie. But if we sin and we confess our faults, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of unrighteousness. Can you imagine the prodigal son living all his life in the foreign land with all the sin that he was going through, eating with pigs, living like a slave, and there was nothing that came to him to say, I have a father. That conviction that makes you mourn and say, how can I be eating with pigs? I have a father. You see, someone could have stayed there eating with the pigs and never feel bad about it. Eating with sinners. And when I mean eating with sinners, I don't mean in the physical sense. I mean dwelling in your lifestyle with sin and with sinners and nothing tells you something is wrong. That's how we lived for many years until that very day, in case you are born again. Where you came to church or someone met you and as he began to open the word of the Lord, you mourned. There was a mourning in your heart. There was a pain in your heart. How can I live this way? How can I continue this way? And the moment that morning began to erupt, it was that morning that made you cry out, I need to be comforted, I, I need help, I need someone that can handle the burdens of my error. Many times, even as believers, when we get born again, there is this tender sensitivity in our heart to feel the pain of error. But you know many times as people begin to grow, we become callous and hard-hearted and stiff-necked that even when we are in error, we don't feel it or we don't even know. How do you abuse a person? And for three days, you never feel something wrong about it. How do you keep malice? And for three days and for one month, nothing hurts you. How do you go into immorality and nothing drags you back to God quickly to cry? One of the blessedness of a believer is something inside him that says, I cannot stay in the miry clay. There was someone who didn't have this blessedness until his life was wrecked totally. The Bible tells us of Cain. In the book of Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. Let's read it together. Genesis chapter 4 and from verse 9. Cain had lured his brother Abel and had slain him. And after he had slain him, God came upon him and brought a question to Cain. It was a question to the intent that it would awaken a sense of conviction in him. It wasn't because God wanted him to feel guilty. It was God wanting him to say, I have missed it. Hear what happened. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Have you noticed the language of God there? He didn't just come and say, Cain, you murderer. Cain, you killer. Cain, you waster of lives. That's not how he went. He wanted to activate a blessedness. Can you feel something is wrong, Cain? And he said, Cain, where is thy brother? And listen to the response of Cain. And he said, I know not. That's not the issue. This is the problem. Am I my brother's keeper? Let's assume Cain was not the one that killed Abel. But if you have not found Abel, wouldn't you mourn that you have lost a loved one? Wouldn't you mourn that something is missing today? We come to church and we don't find our brethren. They are no more amongst us. Do we mourn about it? We come to fellowship and the person that stood with us the last time hand in hand as we prayed for revival is nowhere to be found up again. Does something in you say my brother is not here? Or are we becoming like Cain where our heart is so callous to say am I my brother's keeper? Whether he comes or not, whether he makes it or not, what is my business? But you see, the, most, the, the heavy part of it was, this was the man that had killed his brother. 
if he had heard the voice of God and shouted, I was naked when I heard your voice. Maybe like his father, God would have said, let me bring a remedy to you. I can kill a lamb and cover you up and give you a new life. I can keep a promise that I will come and die for your sins and bruise the head of the serpent. But instead of Cain opening that door where God can comfort him, even though he was the one that made the error, guess what? He shut the door. He shut the door of being blessed with comfort. So the God that longed to come and comfort Cain to come and help him looked upon Cain and said, you are a vagabond. You are lost. You have no destiny. You are now like a beast that perishes. You are now a wasted being. Whatever you do will not count in eternity. You will live and die for vanity. You will live like a goat. Do you know he didn't mourn about it? The Bible says Cain walked out of God's presence. Walked out and built a city and said, who told you I can't make it without you? Who told you you are so important, God? You think my life is tied to you? After all, I've seen the unbeliever make his life beautiful without praying to you. He had lost the blessedness of mourning, mourning for his errors, mourning for the mistakes he had made. When you hurt people, do you still mourn? When you do something knowingly or unknowingly that grieves God, that grieves the standard of eternity, is there something in you that still mourns? God said, if you can ever feel something is wrong, you say you are blessed. Because that is an open door to seek for comfort. That's an open door for God to stretch out. Maybe you are there and then you are mourning. Oh, I've done abortions. Oh, I was in a cult. Oh, I killed someone. I stole. I cheated. I've been a cheat. Oh, I've done wrong given in the exam hall. And each time you move around, there's a sense of grief. And people are laughing at you. Come on, is it not normal? What are you feeling bad about? They are trying to kill that confession, that tenderness in your heart that makes you a blessed personality, that puts you in a place where you run back to God to amend your ways. If it dies, you will not run back to God. If it's ever happening right there, it means you are blessed. What we have with God is a relationship. And you can't keep hurting him in the relationship and not feel something wrong about it and continue. The relationship will die. Do you realize sometimes even when your friend hurts you, what you are just looking for is just that your friend should say, I am sorry. It's not as if you are not willing. The father of the prodigal son was just hanging back saying, just, just come back and say, I am sorry. If you come back and we state you to the best place, just discover it. I pray that as you hear the word of the Lord this very moment, he will activate that blessedness where any error that comes forth from your life, you will sense it. No matter how tiny it is, you will sense it. That's how David was. Oh, David had fallen off. In the day of battle, he didn't go to battle. He looked upon Uriah's wife, took Uriah's wife, slept with her. Set up Uriah. Because the setup didn't work for Uriah to sleep with his wife, he activated a plan to kill Uriah. And he got it done until the prophet Nathan showed up. You see, for Cain, God came directly. For David, God sent a man. Maybe God is sending me your way today. Maybe God is sending someone else your way today to activate that blessedness where you can still feel something is wrong when you do something that God does not like. When Nathan looked at him after the parable Nathan had given him, Nathan said, you are the man. You are wrong. Can we see what David did? In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel. Let's hear the words of David directly. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I 
have sinned against the Lord. Are you seeing his response? It wasn't like he saying, am I Uriah's keeper? Do I know what you are talking about? Do you know sometimes an average believer thinks he's smart when he looks and denies before God the things he has done? He thinks he can cover it up and go. God knows your thoughts from afar. It is wise like David to, to feel it and to say, God, I know. I have sinned against the Lord. Get this statement God gave him through the prophet Nathan. Remember, a prophet is a mouthpiece for God. See what he said. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also had put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Remember, the soul that sinned, it shall die. Do you see the blessedness of being able to mourn? Being able to accept the reality of an error. To feel it. To feel that pain, that grief that makes you cry and tell God, I am sorry. I love you so much. Beyond the laws that you have given, I don't want to hurt you. You see, I have sinned against the Lord. His relationship was more to the Lord. It, it was not as if he had sinned against Uriah by sleeping with Uriah's wife. He had cheated up uh, Uriah's wife by making her a widow. But you know the first thing he cried? I have sinned against the Lord. I have a relationship with God to learn of him, to walk with him. That this thing, before I go to anybody to confess, God, there is something I feel wrong about this matter. I am sorry. And the response of God, you have been forgiven. Listen, God is eager to forgive. He's eager to get you back in order. But do you have the blessedness to mourn about it? Or is your heart becoming callous like Cain? Is there a cry in your heart to say, I want to be better? That I have discovered an error. I have a conviction. And I'm changing my mind about the matter. I want to make God happy. It's blessedness. Each time you mourn, know it's a blessedness. The second thing we see about what God calls blessed when you mourn is when you mourn for the errors or the fall of others. You see, we are not the only one that makes mistakes. Others do. But many times do you notice that we forgive ourselves and find it hard to forgive other people? You forgive yourself for the error you did. But you will not forgive your spouse. You will not forgive your friend. Oh, you forgive yourself. You came to the pastor and confessed and the pastor like Nathan said, you are free, you can go. But are you willing to forgive the pastor? Are you willing to forgive your friend, your neighbor, the leader? Are you willing to forgive the member? Do you feel a cry when somebody else is in error? Someone in the scripture that will not feel such is Balaam. Can you imagine Balaam trying to curse Israel and he could not? God had banned him from doing it. But the Bible tells us in the book of Numbers chapter 31 and verse 16. It says when Balaam saw that he couldn't cause, Balaam had given counsel to Balak. Make Israel sin and let God destroy them. You see, Balaam's one was even extreme. He didn't even wait for them to go into error. He caused the error. He was glad about the error. Why? Because of gain. They paid him. Some of us, it's not as if we are paid. But the last time you heard that that church close to your church, there was a scandal. Did you mourn because the name of the Lord was being blasphemed? We have come to a season in this end time that there is something baffling. How we rejoice, share, talk about the fall of other people. We don't mourn. And we think that we are doing God a favor. We think we are being righteous. 
We think when we catch the woman in the very act and pick up our stones about it, that we are being right. Do you see that Jesus didn't raise the stone? He said, neither do I condemn thee. When other people go into error, there's something inside you cry for them. There's something inside you wish that that prostitute will not be so. Or is the fall of the person not making you feel good? Wow. Now I'm not the only one. They said I was not a good person. Now it has proven itself. It is not a godly virtue for one to rejoice at the fall of another. No, it's not. God demands that if your heart and our spirit will be accurate, it will be such that if one of the sheep is missing, we will not rejoice about it. Even if that sheep was a sheep that was against us. You see that in the life of David, God had rejected Saul, had told King, the prophet Samuel, I, I don't want King Saul again. I found myself a man. Stop crying about him. Go and anoint the next king. The next king had been anointed. For many years, that next king was haunted by Saul. Many times, Saul would throw his javelin and it won't get him. He would throw the javelin again. He will miss it. He would pick up the army, leave town and be running after David. Do you know David had many opportunities to end the life of King Saul? There were so many warriors on his side. Oh, the Bible even makes it clear that the house of David works stronger and the war house of King Saul works weaker. In short, people knew the enmity between King Saul and David. How King Saul hated him. That when King Saul died, someone came rejoicing to tell King Saul, to tell David, sorry, say King Saul, He's dead. Look at the crown. It's time for you. I thought David will rejoice. I thought David will say, at last, my turn has come. It's my turn to shine. But do you see the perspective of David? Let's see 2 Samuel chapter 1 verse 9. 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 9. Okay, let me start from verse. Let's start from verse. Verse 12. Okay. No, sorry. Second Samuel chapter 1 verse 19. 19. So that we don't go too far. Hear what David said concerning the death of Saul. He says, the beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are they mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Don't put it on Facebook and on WhatsApp. Don't make it trend on Instagram. Let it not become something that TikTok sees and a mockery is brought to the body of Christ. He said, lest the daughters of the Philistines uncircumcised rejoice. That means it is a form of an uncircumcised heart to rejoice at the fall of someone else. Had God denied that he doesn't want Saul again? Yes. Had God said Saul is not king again? Yes. But do you see the blessedness of the heart? This man was once anointed. This man was once a mighty vessel in God's hand. Remember they are saying that David had killed his, Saul has killed his thousand, David, eh, Saul has killed his thousand, David is ten thousands. So Saul had won battles for God. The oil of God was once upon him. Do you mourn? You see, we have lost many soldiers in Christ, in the kingdom. And to a large extent, we might never get them back. Because except we mourn for their loss, we will not be comforted. And what will be the comfort? It will be the return, the revival, the repentance, the reinstatement, the reinstallment. 
of those mighty men, of those young men, those young women. Sometimes because we don't mourn, even when they repent and come back, we say, are, are you sure? Are you sure he has really repented? Let's give him five years first and see. The last time you walked past and you saw that faithful brother that was faithful in the ministry, that was faithful with evangelism, now not found again. The last time you saw, was there any mourning in your heart? Or was it like, don't mind it. Am I my brother's keeper? Or was he like, don't worry, Israel can die, just give me my gain. He's no more the reigning man of God, now I am the one. And so you are happy about it? You are happy that somebody fell? Jesus said, no, no. The kind of candidates I'm going to pour out my wine in in the last days are candidates that mourn when they see others fall, when they see error in the life of others. That go to the place of intercession and weep and say, Lord, not again. How are the mighty falling? They are not just praying that people shouldn't fall. They are seeking for ways to stand their ground or to fall. How are the mighty falling? Say, don't share it again. Don't tell it in God. One day I was reading something on Facebook. It was the body of Christ, in my opinion. People just commenting and, and we we're arguing about who was this, who was that, what is this and what is that. And as I went through the comments, I believe it was the Holy Spirit because there were a lot of comments, but he drew me to this one. The person's name was the name of an Ishmaelite. So I wanted to know, what is this guy saying about this discussion? Because we have brought the discussion of the body to the public. Guess what? He wrote... He said, thank God. I can't quote it, but I want to bring it paraphrase. He said, thank God I made Jesus for myself. If not, you people will have made me turn my back. He said, because when I enter this church, you are fighting each other. I enter this place, you are fighting each other. Nobody is mourning at the fall of another. Nobody is saying, I want to help the other. It's like there is a sense of rejoicing. In short, there is even a sense of superiority. He said, blessed are they that mourn. They will be comforted. If we will begin to mourn for the fall of the people that fell from the SU revival, before the SU revival, and for the young people we see, oh, you see elders say just youthful exuberance, allow them. They will, they, will, they, will waste, they, will, they will fizzle away in a short time. And when they fizzle away, you get excited. See, it's just, it's just, it's just zeal, zeal without knowledge. Just give them some time. And when they fail, will you mourn? Do you see that Jesus is looking at us? And even though we are accumulating a lot of things around, Jesus is wondering, I can't call these ones blessed. I can't comfort them. God wants to comfort us by bringing back the prodigal sons. He wants to comfort us by bringing back the lost coin, the lost sheep. He wants to comfort us. But we are not mourning. We are rejoicing. Like Balaam, we have a gain we are making from the errors of others. Can you tell God, I don't want to rejoice at the fall of another. I want a heart like the heart of King David. That even when Absalom that wanted to kill him died, David will not rejoice. It means his throne was secured, but he will not rejoice. Man of God, are you rejoicing because the person that seemingly fought to in ministry is failing? Deacon, are you rejoicing because you prophesied? That Nineveh will be destroyed and Nineveh is destroyed and you are rejoicing? Are you saying, aha, what I've said have come to pass. Have you not seen, I told you guys that this lady that came and said she is born again, she is not going to last. Are you rejoicing that she did not last? Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn for they, not others. They are the ones that will be comforted. We need comfort. There is no joy in anyone going to hell. We need to be comforted. We need to by all means, like Apostle Paul, we say, as long as Christ permits to see that people come back that have been lost. We don't need to stab our wounded soldiers. We need to mourn because one is missing and so our rankings are depleting. So that God will cause us 
to be comforted. Another thing that we see that should bring us to mourn is the sorrows of others. The oppression others are going through. There's someone in the Bible, when I look at his story, I, I wonder why he was that way. But you see, it's not as if we are more different from him. It's just that his scenario was so glaring and was recorded. Is King Hezekiah. Which other king did well like Hezekiah after King David? He did so well. The Bible says he did like his father David. That was the king that did not just bring down altars. He cut down the groves that had lasted many generations. That was the man that when God came to him and told him he will die, he turned to the world and said, God, you know I've served you with a perfect heart. And when he brought his record before God, the courtroom of heaven could not deny it. They gave Hezekiah 15 more years. In the 15 more years, Hezekiah had an error. An error to allow the heathen to come into the holy places of God. The prophet Isaiah came back to him and told him, this thing you have done, God is not happy. God says, everything you have shown them, they will come and take it to captivity in Babylon. Your children will go to Babylon. Guess what? I thought he would mourn to God the way he mourned when it was his own scenario. I thought he would turn to the world again and say, God, show me mercy. Is it not error I have made? I have served you. Have mercy. Guess what he said? It's not in my time it will happen. Invariably, he said, Daniel, go to captivity, be made a eunuch, be castrated. Invariably, he said, go and suffer. As long as it does not hurt me, what's my problem? As long as it's not in my time. As long as it's not my child that is failing, why should I mourn? As long as it is not my tribal people, it's not my clan that is backsliding. So you see parents, when they see their children going into error, they mourn, they pray, they bring counsel. When they see the child of their neighbor going into error, is it my own? Am I the one that will suffer it? Do you notice that the church is suffering from that? An example is the church in Nigeria. As long as the bomb blast is in the northeast, we never cared about it. We just spoke about it. We became cold about it. We didn't mourn about it like we ought to. We didn't hit the gates of heaven like we ought to. Because it was not our place. Because it didn't affect us. Because it was not our sorrow. Until it knocked our doors. There's a strange scenario like that in the scripture. The Bible speaks of prophet Elisha. The prophet that will speak and it comes to pass. Elisha was in town with the elders discussing when a woman had killed her child and they had eaten with her neighbor. It was now another time. What was it? The woman wanted to kill the second child so that they would feed on. The king rent his garment and said, go and tell Elisha. God do so to me. How can Elisha be in this town and people are eating their children? Do you know what shocked me? The moment the person they sent with the message of the threat almost got to the door, Elisha said, has the king not sent that his servant? Lock the door. Don't let him come in. Tell him by tomorrow morning. Ah! So it was because they came to your door to threaten you that you gave the word of liberty. When they were dying, why were you quiet? Why didn't you say by tomorrow morning? Did you have to wait until the thread gets to your door? We will need to mourn for the problems that others are going through. I know you have your three square meal possibly, but do you know there are those who can feed? We don't feel their pain and their sorrow again. Oh, Jesus will walk past and say, can you allow this daughter of Abraham to be in bondage for these 18 years? I can't watch it. Many years I kept wondering, why would the Bible say Jesus was a man of sorrows? A man acquainted with grief. 
How can the Prince of Peace be like that? And over the years, I began to see that time after time, Jesus will look and see the sorrows of others and he will mourn in his heart. He will see how people crying because Lazarus is dead and he will weep. He will see the sorrows and he will grieve in his heart. Have you grieved for something that does not concern you? Does it bring you to pray to groan? Or is it because you, your family, is all safe? Our Christianity is becoming a Christianity of me, myself, and I. And whether that person eats or not, feeds or not, as long as he's not my own, he's not in my denomination, not from my family, I will not attend to it. Can you raise a cry to say, I will not be among those people who don't mourn for others. David was not like that. Guess what? David had sinned. He had numbered the people. God was angry about it and had sent an angel out and the angel was killing people. When David saw people dying, David went and stood in the midst. He said, God, I'm the one. Stop it. Don't hurt people. Let me bear it. God said, step aside, Moses. Let me wipe away these people. Moses said, no, let my name be removed from the book of life if you will not keep these people. Lest they say that you were not able to do what you said you will do. Listen. We can't run Christianity and yet be selfish. God must give us that blessedness where the things that burden the lives of others burden us. I mean you are in your house and you are burdened with what is happening in the Middle East that you raise a cry. You are burdened with what is happening in your village. It's not because they know you but you are mourning and saying God comfort me and the comfort I want is revival. The comfort I want is that I walk down the streets and people who I don't even know encounter you because I was mourning. The comfort I want is that God will be seen in offices even when they don't recognize me in that place. I don't know how many people knew that Moses was telling God, take away, take away, take away my name from the book of life but sustain these people. I don't know if Israelites knew that David had come out and told the angel, stop is enough. I don't know. But they were mourning because other people were in sorrow. It is a blessedness that your heart will mourn when other people are in sorrow. That your heart will mourn when other people are in oppression. That when you pass a place and see Satan oppressing the people, you will mourn. You will mourn. You will mourn in your heart. There is a promise attached to it. God said, you will, I will be comforted if we can mourn for the things we see around that is wrong. To mourn concerning what is happening in the government. Years back, I was privileged to talk to someone. And while we spoke, he said something that broke my heart. He said, things have gotten so bad. What to do now is to forget about it and find a way to help yourself. I went back home. Forget about it. Forget about the sorrows others are going through. Do you know someone didn't forget about it? That's why you heard the gospel. Do you know there was a mourning in the heart of missionaries all the way from Europe, from UK, coming down to black Africa? They didn't forget about it. They had electricity, roads, light, a better standard of living. They came knowing they would be butchered, knowing that diseases will weary them out. They didn't forget about it. 
It was that morning that moved them away. Men like Livingstone. Men that will live where they are because God must go somewhere. One of those mighty examples in scripture is John the Baptist. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. I left the beauty of home. I could have been in the lineage of the high priest and eat of the best food, drink of the best wine, wear regalia designed by Yahweh. Be respected and revered in public. But here am I in the wilderness with camel skin. Raising a cry so that a generation, a generation, their hearts will be turned to the father. And that the father's hearts will be turned to them. He was crying and mourning for others. Not because he had lost his way. It was a blessedness. And guess what? John the Baptist was comforted. People went to Jesus so much that he said, let him increase that I may decrease. If revival happens today, will you say it was God comforting you? If someone gets born again today, would you say it was God comforting you? What will you say about it? The fourth thing we'll look at that has to do with the reasons why man should mourn, that God should see our heart with a state of mourning, is concerning delayed promises and prophecies. God said if anyone will call upon him, he will hear them, he will heal their land. Especially if they will humble themselves. Jonah gave the people the message. Nineveh, a city that didn't know their left from their right, engaged the message and God came to their rescue. Guess what? Jonah was angry. As far as Jonah was concerned, the promise of God to deliver people should not come to pass. They should die to prove that he speaks a word that it must come to pass. Nineveh should be destroyed. So it should be said when Prophet Jonah says a thing, it is so. I want to strongly believe that Prophet Jonah was a man of such reputation. No wonder when he spoke, even people that didn't understand Yahweh said, who preached? He said Jonah. Jonah? If Jonah is the one that is prophesying, we should all repent. We've heard of him. Whenever he speaks, it comes to pass. But this time around, Jonah was not so much interested in the promises of God delivering mankind. He was more interested in his prophecy coming to pass. There are two dimensions in the prophetic. There are prophecies that speak of the judgment, the wrath of God. You shouldn't rejoice because those prophecies come to pass. There should be a grief in your heart that God told you that something wrong is going to happen and it happened. And there should be a mourning in your heart if God has said something right and the thing is being delayed. Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 9 I think around verse 2 yes verse 2 the Bible says Daniel understood by the books by the prophecies of Jeremiah that God was coming to deliver the Israelites from Babylon. The captivity that I had come to by the error of Hezekiah was to terminate after 70 years. The moment he saw 70 years activating, there was a mourning, a mourning that erupted in the life of Daniel. Daniel began a fasting and a prayer. God, it is time. You can't keep us one more day. The same thing the Israelites did when they were in captivity in Egypt. They cried out to God. God said, I've heard their cry. I've remembered my covenant with Moses. 400 years is enough. It's time for them to move. But remember, they had to cry. 
There are many prophecies. The prophecies of revival. The prophecies of healing. The words of encouragement that God has given you or given people. And you know about it and it is not coming to pass. If you can still feel a cry in your spirit saying, God, please, this thing should come to pass. Jesus says you are blessed. That it is a state of blessedness to hunger for the good that God has proposed for the people. Do you know it was in that season when Daniel prayed and fasted for 21 days that God didn't just end the captivity of Israel in Babylon. God brought him revelations of what will happen between then and the end time. He was not just comforted with the deliverance of Israel. He was comforted with the agenda of God. It is certain that if we come to God by faith, he will do exceeding abundantly above all that we have asked or think. That means that if we ever mourn and say, God, you said this. Your word says this. Your word told me this. When I read in the morning, this was the word of comfort that came. If we ever will mourn, we'll bring it as a cry before God consistently. God said he will comfort us. And when he comes, the comfort will come better. God told Israel, after 400 years, I will take you out of captivity. The promise was to Israel, the children of Abraham. When they cried to God, when God was going to bring them out, it was not only Israelites that left. Oh no, they were Egyptians that decided to follow the God of Israel. More than they asked or imagined. God has more than we ask or imagine to offer us. If and only if, he will find that blessedness of mourning. He will find that blessedness with a cry. I want us to look at this scripture as we try to cap up this session. Psalms chapter 42. Let's see something in the life of David. Psalms chapter number 42. Oh God, baptize us with such a blessedness. Baptize me with such a blessedness. A blessedness that will mourn the mourning that will cause you to comfort me. Let me read. Psalm 42, we'll read from verse 1 and to 3. And see a promise in God that David was hungry for. That David was mourning and crying for. He said, as the heart panted after the water brooks, so panted my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsted for God for the living God, when, this is the issue, when shall I come and appear before God? This is the morning. My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? O Malatakabai, Jesus. What has your life been that people are saying, where is your God? Maybe you have been mourning for revival, crying. You have kept yourself. Anytime something was going wrong, there was a conviction that made you come into alignment to be in tune with God always. Oh, when you saw that fail, you stood for them. You have even been called mother of Jesus, brother Jesus, uncle of Jesus. People have seen you and then they mock because the prophecies and the promises God have told you over the years have not come to pass. And people continually are asking, where is your God? I thought you said five years ago, God said, I thought 10 years ago you told us of a revival God showed you in a vision. Now the place is still in chaos. In short, decadence is more in the place than this. And when this thing strikes hard and again and again, you are beginning to get wearied. Listen, if you can still sustain this dimension of blessedness, look at what the psalmist said. He said, my tears have been my meat day and night. I have been mourning. When will the promise that God made to me come to pass? 
When will I have that child he spoke about? When will that marriage come? When will that appointment come? When will that breakthrough come? When will that encounter come? When will the anointing come? When will my manifestation begin? You look into the pages of what God said. You see a lot. You remember the visions, the encounters. Yet, you can't see the manifestations. And possibly like Joseph, you have even told men about it already. Now the question is, where is your God? Do you know there are people whom God had gave, given promises to and as we speak now they have forgotten the promises. They don't mourn about it. They don't cry about it for it to come to pass. It is something in the past in short they've lost faith about it and right now you are saying God give me back faith to believe. Open that book. I don't know who I'm talking to now. Open the book again. Let your heart be activated. God has promised he will comfort everyone that will mourn to the intent that what he has said should come to pass for good. Don't give up your child, ma. Mom, don't give up on your child. Don't give up. The promise God made you concerning your son that he's going to serve God. Don't give up. I don't know. I feel an opening of word of knowledge of God showing things, things happening already. You can't give up now. Mommy, you can't give up on your child now. You can't give up on her now. It's not now. It's not now. It's not now. Open the book, dust it, and go back to God and say, I come with a morning, with tears, day and night. I come with a cry from my heart. Comfort me. And listen, there's a difference between comfort and consolation. When somebody dies, Many times what we do is to console them. Oh, sorry, the person doesn't come back. But when the Bible speaks about comforting, the comforter, he said, I will give you another of the same kind. He didn't mean, I will tell you, oh, sorry, Jesus is gone. Just manage your life. Don't worry. When you die, you will meet him. No. When Jesus spoke about comforting us, he spoke about giving us the Holy Ghost so that we will not miss Jesus. When God comes to comfort you, he comes with a replacement. He comes with a fulfillment. He comes with a token to prove that the the things he said are real. Can you still see it? Can you feel the cry? Remember those days you pray in the day and in the night and it looked like something was wrong with you and people were asking you where is your God? If you were doing that, you were alive. That was a sign of blessedness. To come to a point where you don't feel that pain again, you are losing a blessedness. Blessed are those that mourn for they shall be comforted. The comfort of a man praying for revival is revival. The comfort of a man praying for breakthrough is breakthrough. And as long as you don't lose the blessedness of that morning, God says your path is continue to mourn, to pray, to cry out day and night. His path is that he will comfort you. God cannot lie. We might not be able to determine the time just like David. David said, when? When shall I come and I appear before you? When will be my turn, O oh God, to see the fulfillment of the things? Hear me. Times are seasons are in his hand and he makes all things beautiful. But he has a promise. A promise that is greater than any other thing. He said he has exalted his word above his name. A promise he has taken his integrity on. What is the promise? If you will mourn, you will be comforted. Jesus said, if I come, will I still find faith? Will I still find someone who has not lost hope of the things I told him and he is holding the substance and he is saying, I will not give up. Oh, the book of Hebrews tells us of people that they died not having received the promise, but they died in faith. That means as they were leaving the earth, they were still holding the substance. No wonder Abraham, Father Abraham, got Abraham's bosom. Have you lost faith? Do you now look at the word of God and it does not trickle it down again? It does not move you again. There is no broken and contrite heart that makes you mourn when God brings rebuke because of error. When you see others in error, when you see others in oppression, when the word of the Lord is not yet fulfilled, awake. 
let that tingle in your spirit come alive. Let it come alive. Let it come alive. That cry that says, I will not stop crying to God day and night until he comforts me. There is a season for you to appear before God. I will not. He says, the heart pants after the water broke. So, panted my soul after thee. My soul thirsted for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When shall I come and appear before God? If you read that scripture, you see him talk about deep, call it unto deep, because the waves of sorrows, of pains, of challenges had come over him. But guess what? If we understand the thing that Jesus was saying in this scripture, you will get that he's saying something. What draws his comfort is mourning. Even amongst men we know, when people mourn, your natural reaction to them is to comfort them. God said, blessed are they that mourn for thee shall be comforted. When we begin to lose the feel of what breaks God's heart, there's a blessedness we are losing. Do you know it breaks his heart when we go into error? When we dine with darkness? Do you know it breaks his heart when other people fall into error? Do you know it breaks his heart when people are under oppression of darkness? Do you even know it breaks his heart when the things he has told us have not yet happened? God is not excited that he gives you a word and it has not come to pass. If there is something God rejoices over, it is our manifestation. Because no man lighted a candle and puts it under the bushel. No, he sets it upon the table that may light up the whole place. God didn't give you a word to hide you and waste you. He gave you a word that he will put you upon the tabletop for the nations to see and run to him. But he said, blessed are you if you still mourn, if you still hunger, if you still mourn, if you still hunger, if you still mourn, if you still hunger, if you'll be mourning and hungry for the fulfillment of the things God has told you or any of the things we have spoken about, can you begin to pray in the spirit and pour your heart 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 and say, oh God, oh God, comfort me. Is it a matter of your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, a promise in God, a challenge, an addiction? You've been saying, no, I will not give up. The devil is saying relax in it, relax in it. Others are doing it. But each time you do it, there's a cry, there's a cry. It's a blessedness. It's a blessedness. That cry is a magnet for the comfort of God. Can you begin to cry out to God and say, let the morning magnify until God comforts me. And if you are out there and you have lost that blessedness, Jesus wants to pour it out again. He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Man, they come si parakai. Perande sefele mina munkai kai. Umbra safeila. God can administer and activate your heart again where you long for his presence. Those days where you didn't feel God's presence and you will weep and you will take a retreat and say, God, I need you around. I need to know you are there. Now you are not feeling his presence. You can't hear his voice and you are comfortable. God has come to activate again that blessedness that would not let you be comfortable with anything that breaks God's heart that will not let you to be at peace with anything that God is not excited about. Oh, Marakabune. 
vara kapone piata kapone perunka sabretos kaya have you lost something and god is saying more about it he says if a man that is a shepherd had lost one he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one hey father do not disown your son no 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 god says you will raise his matter as a morning as a crying for him to return no matter how far he has gone god has a promise that he will comfort you and the comfort is that he will do something he will do something about the matter he will do something about the matter mahateke barabo kapara suvara kaporia then the cara santos came in antaya restore to us a heart that is full of your tender mercy a heart that is full of your tender mercy a heart that is not corrupt that is not cold a heart that does not say where is was my brother where is he no 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 we need a heart tender a heart like the one you did for david amanante sapara ko felemenai Mambra kaboka bele baruka balate kete binai Oh give us the heart of the father Mine kombra sasila bra mene de kombra sasavaria the heart of the good shepherd Ilambrun kapeli kwate pena ndai kepela suveri kaborande ya aina aino mena nde kombrea we don't want to be stiff necked we don't want to be stiff necked we don't want to be stiff necked can you pray can you pray let my heart be tender let my heart be tender let my heart be tender let it love even in adversity let it cry for revival let it not give up on the people god has not given up on let it call for repentance in the day repentance is needed imamun sakabonate perako balate kobarate Jala kambro saklis kaborante kifasaila tai kome kapona is god bringing to remembrance somebody you should mourn about a situation you should mourn about it is a blessed thing is a blessed thing don't feel bad that when you see people going through things you are moved for them as if it is your own it is a blessed thing don't lose it sister don't lose it sister don't lose that heart that is what makes you an intercessor the capacity the ability that burden that you feel for people that you feel their soul. Jeremiah said when God sent him to the to the people in Babylon he by the river of Kaba when he sat there he sat where they sat he had to feel what they were feeling he sat there for three days until he could feel their pain before he opened his mouth it would be hard sister to be an intercessor when you can't mourn for the things that God mourns for that God what breaks your heart will break our heart what makes you cry will make us cry that was how david was he said god the people you hate i hate the things you hate i hate the places you hate i hate that will rejoice when god rejoice that until god sees the revival that gives him joy we will continue to mourn for it to pray for it to cry for it that our tears day and night will be unto him that is able to comfort us mm. Cause our heart to pant after you, as the heart pants after the water brook. Oh, oh, cause it, Lord, 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 cause it, Lord. I feel the repentance happening. I feel people being activated, coming back to God, crying back to God and saying, "Jesus, I am here again. Jesus, I am here again. Jesus, I am here again." Listen to me, you are not being emotional about it. When a man mourns, his emotion comes along with it. When he stares from your spirit, he will, "Oh, maraka ma senderi makabria." Sir, it is not making you small. Jesus will wept is there any man that is as strong as him as firm as him he wept because he could relate with the sorrows of other people 
O kame sele fara kamosai kaperatoski baradash. You can't do evil again and be callous about it. Mm, 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 mm. Not again, not again, not again. Your heart is activated to sense the movement of the Holy Ghost, to feel that move. Oh, marasate koprese kivara kapolate. Kaima, kaima, God, purge us of that callousness, of that hardness of heart that does not move when God speaks. And baptize us so much, O oh God, that as long as we are in the body, we will mourn and groan until we are clothed with our heavenly tabernacles. Ah, maskai kovarande bere kovelai. Baki kakumbra sasila varania na munta. Imambre kalu varanda itatuane merekedishki. Zasila rungla sky kai kai kumbre ne miataya. That our hearts we mourn and say maranat and say come back again. That our heart we look forward to the return of the coming king. That our heart we long that as long as we are in the body we will look for when we will leave and come to you. We don't want to be so satisfied in the air that we don't mourn for our return back home. Mm. Oh, bake sekida barakumina. Bayande sekila pranko safaraski. Oh, marai kapo, kapo. Oh, Jesus. You used to cry. You used to long for an encounter with Jesus. Now you don't long for it again. You are satisfied with religion and with activities. I see God activating your heart. A desire to encounter God by his word. Oh, mame kevra kapo, 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 kapo. Mere kaparape pe. Na mambo katua kabena Besi kante prete Kabola kafaila Imambe kaposa Si katua kabelata Imakero vesaila You couldn't walk away until you hear him You used to sit with the word until you hear him Now when you open the Bible Even whether you hear him or not Whether he speaks or not You are not moved, you just walk out Because you are satisfied with religion You are not waiting to be comforted By the word of life, by the word of power God is reactivating again That hunger, that cry that cry, that mourning, that blessedness that will not let you move until you get comforted. Ah, Baraka Shandayabaya. Peter was mourning that Jesus had died. John was mourning. Many were mourning that Jesus had died. But there was someone whose mourning was beyond their own. It was Mary Magdalene. When they checked the tomb and they couldn't see him, the Bible tells us that they left. They left. They walked away. There was nothing bothering them again. After all, he cannot be found. But she remained there. She remained there. The mourning in her heart was so much that she was not willing to give up on Jesus whether he's alive or dead, whether he answers her prayer or not, whether he gives her prayer back to or not. There was that time that whether God gave you what you wanted or not, he was your satisfaction. Jesus was your satisfaction but now it is not so again. There is a restoration happening. A restoration is happening. She turned and told us Ms. Gardner and said, where have you kept my master? Where have you kept my Lord? Even when it seemed that Jesus will not do anything for her again. She still called Jesus Lord. She was hungry for his presence. Let me see my master, whether he looks dead or alive. Do you remember those times you just wanted to hear God? Whether what he will say will please you or not, whether what he says is the answer to your question or not, you just wanted to hear him say, my daughter. You wanted to hear him say again, my son. There is a longing rising in your spirit. It is rising in your spirit. A longing once again to hear him call your name. To hear him call your name so that you can look up and say, Rapuni. You can say, Master. That hunger for Jesus. That morning to be comforted. Not with a breakthrough, but with his presence. Not with a miracle but with his presence. Not with a miracle. Not with another thing but with a word. You want something beyond what he can offer. You are longing again for his voice. I pray 
pray for you. Let the voice of God come alive. It comes alive. It comes alive. You cannot be hearing him by a donkey alone. It comes alive. It comes alive. It comes alive. It comes alive in the name of Jesus. That hunger is throwing a comfort. Oh, she mourned. She cried. She cried. She waited because nothing else could comfort her until she sees Rabuni. Until she sees Jesus. And guess what? Mary was comforted. Oh, as you hear the sound of my voice, in the name of Abba, Father, let your comfort come. Let your comfort come. Whatever you have been mourning and crying about, oh, my woman, let your comfort come. Your comfort has come. Your comfort has come. Your comfort has come. Oh, Jesus Christ, kind. Oh, Barakeme na Shabaka, Eliza, say, Ferani, Ferani, my his presence invades where you are. Jesus Sky. O cante minani, i bai capo ferica. There's an impartation of a cry in your heart, of a cry in your heart, of a blessedness to mourn. Jesus looks upon you and he speaks, and as he speaks, the reality becomes the reality of your life. Blessed are you as you hear the sound of my voice. You mourn and you receive the comfort of the Holy Ghost. You'll be mourning for healing. You'll be mourning for healing. He comes with comfort. The healer comes with comfort. The healer comes with comfort. Oh, I don't know what the situation is. Can you mention the situation as we join faith together? And I ask, Abba, Father, comfort everyone as they listen. Comfort. Comfort them. Comfort them. Comfort these ones. Comfort these ones. In the name of Jesus, upon the credit of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, unto his ascension upon that which he does for us now as our advocate, I ask, Abba, Father, comfort Comfort these ones. Mm. Someone say you have missed it. You know you have missed it. God told you and you decided against the will of God. And now you are crying. You are telling God, how will I get it back? Abar kofe shabarai kabosa saila. He's a God of another chance and again. The Bible said the clay was mad in the hands of the potter. But he made it again. He made it again. He can make you again. I join faith with you and I pray, Jesus, make her again. Make him again. Make this one again. Ah, Murasaila Kosesa Konvra Kaseli Namantaya. Make this one again. Can you open your heart and tell God, I receive the impartations of this blessedness. I receive it in the name of Jesus. I receive it in the name of Jesus. I receive it in the name of Jesus. Even as this session is rounding up, I crave your indulgence. What is happening online can round up officially, physically, but there where you are, can you continue with God Oh, 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 I see God is going to do a work even to your dreams. Can you continue with God until that peace of his comfort comes upon you? The Lord bless you. The Lord hear your prayer. The Lord attend to the cry of your heart. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus loves you. Be comforted in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.